I feel like I'm going to be crowned Queen of England or something. But, you know, I hope nobody's taking photographs of my activities in my spare time. Uh, okay, let's just go. Yep. Um, I just want to Mm. Um, and I was at your talk there last spring. Last spring, yeah. Which one? At GTU. GTU. Graduate GTU. Theological Union. Oh, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, my question concerns your vision of a libertarian socialism and uh, the way that we, we might get there. Um, and what do you see as institutions uh, in our society today or uh, structures do you think that we can build on to move toward a society of justice and solidarity? Well, uh, the last two words define the vision, I think. Uh, justice, solidarity, freedom, uh, equal rights. These are all ideas that come straight out of the Enlightenment, and in fact, out of classical liberalism, uh, which is, classical liberalism is a very anti-capitalist, contrary to what everybody says. Uh, and classical liberal and Enlightenment ideals lead in a very direct path, I think, to what was called libertarian socialism or anarchism or something like that. Uh, the idea that people have a fundamental core right and need to be free, creative, not under external constraints, that any form of uh, authority requires legitimation. Uh, the burden of proof is always on an authoritarian structure, whatever it may be, whether it's you know, uh, owning people or uh, sex-linked or whatever, a uh, child parent. Any form of authority has to be challenged. Sometimes they can be justified, maybe in that case, okay, you live with them. Uh, the, but the, for the most part, not, and the, that would then lead quite directly to what were kind of truisms about a century ago. I mean, now they sound really crazy because there's been such a deterioration of values. But uh, if you look at the thinking of just ordinary people, like say the working class press in the mid 19th century, uh, it, which grew where, where the ideas just grew out of the same soil, Enlightenment classical liberal soil, the ideas look. Obviously, people should not be machines. They shouldn't be tools of production. They shouldn't be ordered around. Uh, we don't want to, we don't want chattel slavery, you know, like black slaves in the South. But we also don't want what was called since the 18th century wage slavery, uh, which is not very different, namely where you have to rent yourself to survive. And in a way, it was argued with some plausibility that you're worse off than a slave that way. Actually, slave owners argued that. When slave owners were defending slavery, there was a kind of a moral debate that went on, and it had shared moral turf, as a lot of moral debate did. And the slave owners made a plausible point. They said, look, uh, we own our workers. You just rent your workers. Uh, when you own something, you take much better care of it than when you rent it. Like, to do it a little anachronistically, if you rent a car, you're not going to pay as much attention to taking care of it as if you own the car for obvious reasons. Similarly, if you own people, you're going to take more care of them than uh, if you rent people. You rent people, you don't want them anymore, you throw them out. Uh, you own people, well, you got a sort of an investment in them, so you make them healthier and so on. So the slaves, slave owners, in fact, argued uh, and that, look, we're a lot more moral than you guys with your uh, capitalist uh, 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 wage slave system. And uh, ordinary working people understood that. So, you know, people would, uh, like after the Civil War, you could find in the American working class press uh, bitter complaints over the fact that, look, we fought to end chattel slavery and now you're driving us into wage slavery, which is the same sort of thing. Well, okay, this, uh, this is one core institution of the society where people are forced to become tools of others, machines, tools of others to be cast out if they're not necessary. I mean, that's just a grotesque relation, arrangement totally contrary to the ideals of classical liberalism or enlightenment values or anything else. Uh, and it's now become a sort of standard doctrine, but that's just a victory of absolutism. And we should dismantle all that stuff uh, culturally. You know, It starts with cultural changes. 
you got to change your minds, you know, and your spirit, and recover what was uh, common understanding uh, in a more civilized period, let's say a century ago in the shop floors of Lowell, Massachusetts, and so on. Uh, uh, recover those that understanding, and then we work to uh, simply democratize in all institutions, free them up, uh, eliminate authoritarian structures. Uh, as I say, you find them everywhere. I mean, you find them from families up to corporations, it's all kind of authoritarian structures in the world. They all ought to be challenged. Very few of them can resist that challenge. They survive mainly because they're not challenged. Uh, they're not really very strong. Uh, they look strong. But uh, there's a point that was made by David Hume a couple hundred years ago with it's worth bearing in mind. Hume was very conservative, as you know. He was so much so that Thomas Jefferson, the great believer in free speech, when he established the University of Virginia uh, to be a counter to Harvard, you know, so they wouldn't send southern gentlemen up to be uh, distorted by the northern, you know, federalists. Uh, he was the founder of the University of Virginia, and he, uh, there, you had to read the history of England in those. I mean, universities are mainly law schools in those days, like you're training lawyers and people, and naturally had to read the history of England. And unfortunately, the main history of England was by David Hume, who had Tory ideas. He's very conservative, and Jefferson didn't want the students to be allowed to read it. So what he, there, there was a... Uh, a bowdlerized version. Somebody had written a version of Hume in which he had kept the same style but eliminated all the offending passages. You know, So Jefferson uh, insisted that that be the only version that students be allowed to read. They would be told it's Hume and so on, but that's Hume. Anyway, as, even though you know much too conservative to be allowed to be read by uh, Thomas Jefferson's college, uh, still he recognized, uh, you look at his fundamental principles of government, he recognized something which is very much worth bearing in mind. Uh, he raised a kind of paradox of power. He said, how, do pow how does power sustain itself? He said, if you think about it, power is always in the hands of the people who are oppressed. It's in the hands of the governed. They really have power. Uh, and he says this is true of the most uh, oppressive society, what we would call totalitarian society, as of the most free. Power is in the hands of the governed, so how come they submit themselves to the authority of others? He said, well, force is an element, but he said the real element is opinion. Uh, you have to control their opinion. Of course, he was in favor of it. You know, he's a Tory. So he says, well, the, what you have to do is make sure you control the opinion of the people, uh, meaning make them believe, you know, make them uh, saturate their minds with uh, uh, ideology, carry out what we call propaganda. We didn't have the term in those days. Uh, and uh, control their opinion, and you got them. Uh, that means you, you change their aspirations, you restrict their aspirations to personal things, to commodities, to uh, break down the natural bonds among people, force them to forget what they understand, you know, that they basically want freedom and independence and justice and so on. Everybody understands, every child understands that. So you have to work really hard to drive it out of their heads. And if you can drive it out of their heads and you control their opinion, then they'll submit. You know, and they'll submit whether you're a, a, a brutal state or a more free society. In fact, it's more important in the free societies. In the 20th century, when it be, you know, in, in Hume's day, there wasn't much difference. Every society was absolutist. But as the societies differentiated over the years with popular struggles and you know, winning the franchise and so on and so forth, uh, the difference between the freer societies and the more you know, like totalitarian or command societies became clearer, and a point was began to be understood that Hume didn't talk about, and that is that control of opinion is much more important in the free societies. So like in, say, Soviet Russia, they didn't really care much what people thought. A Franco-Spain, let's say, you know, fascist state, uh, people read much more broadly and widely than they do in the United States. I mean, like, say, I mean, it's true, in fact. You know, you could you go to a Marxist bookstore, you know. I mean, if you got out of line too much, okay, they send you to the torture chamber in downtown Madrid. But uh, the uh, since there were techniques of control just by force, there was not much, you know, wasn't much concern about what people thought. It's sort of believe what you like, we'll beat you over the head with a bludgeon, you know. When you get to the freer societies, there's a lot more concern with what people think. And that has been understood. Uh, that's part of the reason for the rise of the public relations industry in the United States. Public relations industry is a propaganda agency of business. 
which was, it's an American creation, you know, it was created in the early part of the century to try to, as they put it then, to control people's minds. Uh, bec and that's, you know, I don't know if they read Hume, but, you know, it's not a deep point. Anybody can understand it without reading Hume. Uh, they understood that unless you control people's minds, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, people's mind, you know, the, the what's, what was called in the business press, the greatest hazard facing industrialists is the rising political power of the masses. I'm quoting. I mean, you recognize that the business press is very Marxist, super Marxist. I mean, all the values are inverted, you know, but they believe in class struggle. They talk about the masses, you know, and beating down the masses and all that sort of thing. In fact, business press reads kind of like malice tracts, little red books and things, just with all the values reversed. Uh, and they understood that you've got to control people's opinion because, as Hume put it, power is in the hands of the governed if they ever realize it. Uh, and if they realize it and they try to recognize what their own values are and pursue them, we're really going to be in trouble because there's not going to be any way to control people. Uh, well, okay, you ask what institutions can change things. I think it, if you think it through, it's kind of obvious. You have to start by changing people's minds. I mean, take, say, uh, something pretty close to here. Take, say, liberation theology in, in the 70s and 60s and 70s. How did it work? Well, you know, people, and priests and nuns, went and started base communities where people read the Gospels and they thought about it. You know, peasants, maybe, un, maybe illiterate people, or who knows, you know, but they, you know, they, they thought about what it meant. Uh, they gave their own, you can interpret in a lot of ways, they gave an interpretation which was oriented toward the preferential option for the poor. People began to do things like, I mean, I, I saw some of this happening. You know, you go to a very, I remember once going to a village in uh, Nicaragua which was run by an extremely conservative order of nuns. I forget which one, but the one that runs all the schools for girls in Latin America. Some of you, I forget who they are, you probably know. But you know, there's real ultra right wing, you know, but they were, but they were running, they were working in a, in a village where the peasants were so isolated from one another that they couldn't even work together to the point of trying to get water. And one of their biggest, and they, they were good people. I mean, the mother superior was walking around, you know, trying to convince people to get uh, uh, injections and things like that. And they, their big achievement when I was there was that they had gotten the peasants to cooperate enough to uh, work on a common well. Uh, they had a, you wouldn't believe the way it worked, that there was a, they, there was, you know, this is real poor country. So they had a, um, they had an ox and they tied the, I had a rope t tied to the neck of the ox, or however it works, and it was pulling the, and the, the ox climbed up a hill, and as it climbed up a hill, it pulled water out of the well, and then people would come and, you know, take the water, it's the first water they ever had, and then the ox would be led down to the bottom of the hill again and would walk up. Okay, that was a real achievement, and it was helping bring people to understand, look, you work together, we're all better off. Uh, the kind of you know, authoritarian regime that you've lived under, which kept you separated and kept you isolated, is just destroying you. To try to get those thoughts into people's heads is hard. And once it gets started, it goes on, you know, and then they develop cooperatives and associations. And then, of course, the death squads come and the U.S. trainers come. And people like you and me pay taxes to killers who will put an end to all of this. Uh, well, okay, you think this through, it's not very hard to figure out what ought to be done whether it's there or whether it's here. Uh, and the aim ought to be to dismantle authoritarian institutions. And like I say, they're all over the place. Uh, you find them in the family, but the core ones, the ones that simply have to be radically changed if you're ever going to have a free society, uh, are, the institutions of the, are the, the institutions that involve production and distribution and decision about what, what life is going to be like. And that happens to be in executive boardrooms like the hotel where I was staying last night. You know, you walk around and you see who's making the decisions. It's not very hard to find them. Uh, and uh, those sectors of society, uh, with their extraordinary power, it's now, you know, even international, uh, and huge agglomerations of power. They have plenty of violence behind them. Uh, much of it is provided by the United States. Uh, there's a reason why we have uh, more than half of the total military expenditures of the whole world. The reason is because we're the big killers. 
and we have to be around to make sure that nobody gets out of hand. You know, peasants start building a well, we've got to be in there to have a death squad that'll take care of them. Uh, and that's, what a lot, that's a lot of what we're involved in. And you and I are involved in it, because this is a pretty free country. Like, if we're involved in it, we decided to be involved in it, or we decided to look the other way, or something like that. Okay, uh, those are things that can be done. Uh, and on and on, up till the point where you just dismantle. Uh, and I don't think these institutions are very strong. I agree with Hume. Uh, if people change their conceptions and decide, look, I'm not going to be kicked around, and you get together, uh, there's nothing to stop you from taking over a factory, let's say. I mean, the police will stop you, but if the police are just other people. And if understanding and uh, solidarity has spread enough, they won't stop you. Incidentally, that's why when countries are ruled uh, by either colonial rulers or every country is kind of colonized, you know, even if it's just in itself. I mean, there's some sector that colonizes everyone else. And it's even more dramatically obvious when it's a foreign ruler. What they typically do is use military forces that are not local. So like when in China, when they put down the Tiananmen Square demonstrations, you take a look at what they did. They did not use the local PLA, you know, army forces. They took them in from the provinces. Uh, when the British ran India they, for, you know, 100 years, they ran it with Indian soldiers, but from other places. You know, like the Gurkhas, for example, you know, famous Gurkhas, they're Nepalese, you know, hill tribesmen. And you could sort of bring them down to smash up the local people. Uh, we do the same thing. Uh, we bring in, you know, sort of forces from the outside. Actually, it's going on right now in the occupied territories, in uh, uh, the Israeli occupied territories. Uh, the Israel Arafat Agreement, one crucial part of it is to make sure that those territories are controlled by foreigners. They're called Palestinians, but in fact, they are foreign Palestinians. The ones who are trained, who are brigades of the Jordanian or army or something like that. They're the ones who are being brought in. That's the standard technique of colonial control. Uh, and uh, so, you know, when you bring in, when, when they wanted to put down the homestead strike in uh, 1892, they get the, Pens the National Guard from somewhere else, you know, not the local cops in homestead. Uh, so, yeah, there are police and there are armies and there are security forces, but, you know, and there are techniques which are well understood for using them. And the answer to that is just more solidarity, you know, broader solidarity. So you don't get soldiers from somewhere else who'll come and smash up people. Uh, and uh, that's hard, you know. Uh, I mean, you, it's, uh, the, the fact that societies are colonized and so stratified offers all kinds, it means you don't have to go very far away. Like when the Chicago police were uh, trying to destroy uh, political organizing in the black ghetto back in the 60s, uh, they were able to work together with other criminal organizations like them, the FBI, uh, and simply set up uh, assassinations and other criminal activities to get rid of leaders in the black ghetto, which they did. And, you know, they happened to come from Chicago, but they came from a different stratum of Chicago, which was so separated, it might as well have been from, you know, Alaska. Uh, and it's because of the stratifications and so on that these things work. Actually, it's kind of interesting. If you look at the details, it's very illuminating. So take Chicago. Uh, when the FBI was trying to, uh, the Panthers in Chicago back in the 60s were a pretty constructive group. They were doing real things, a lot of community organizing and so on. And the main Panther leader was a guy named Fred Hampton. Uh, maybe some of you know this stuff. This is your own history. You really ought to know it, a recent history. But uh, the, the, at first, the FBI tried to use the colonization that is internal to the black ghetto. That is, they tried to get a black criminal gang to assassinate Hampton. Now, typically, the police and the FBI like the criminals. They work with them. They're more or less the same class and the same interests, and they're all involved in the same control system, so a lot of interaction, like Columbia or anywhere else, you know, the security forces and the criminals are all in the same bag, you know, they have the same interest. Uh, so uh, the FBI, in fact, had pretty good relations with the main criminal gang in the ghetto, which was the Blackstone Rangers, and they tried to get the Rangers to kill Fred Hampton. The way they did it was by, uh, a lot of this stuff came out in court cases right here in Chicago later. Uh, they sent uh, fake letters to the head of the FBI, I didn't know it. Uh, namely, uh, there was enough development had taken place so that the Rangers and the Panthers were integrated. They were working together, you know, and they had broken down these barriers. 
and therefore they knew at once that it was a police fake, you know, so nothing happened. And then the FBI had to mobilize another colonial force, namely Chicago police, uh, and bring them in, and they did the job. They assassinated him in a straight Gestapo-style assassination. I mean, nothing covered up about it except by the press. But uh, the, uh, uh, and it's very clear what happened, isn't it? That, okay, that's the kind of thing that happens in small detail, but it also happens in, you know, big, much bigger frame. And that's the kind of thing you have to overcome uh, recognizing Hume's point exactly. If you can control opinion, you know, if you can get people to think for themselves uh, and to work together, it's going to be very hard to do these things. So that's the method. It's always been the method for getting anywhere. You know, it's been, it was the method for getting rid of slavery, for, you know, for getting rid of feudalism, for um, uh, feminism in the last 30, 40 years, uh, for the achievements of liberation theology in Latin America until they were destroyed by violence in that case because they couldn't compete with U.S. violence. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, that it's just a matter of, and that's our fault. You know, the fact that it was destroyed is our fault. Uh, we couldn't control our own criminals and they were able to destroy it. But uh, uh, the, the t I think if these things all tell you exactly what you have to do, and there's plenty of opportunities. I mean, we don't face death squads like they do in the in Central America, see. I don't oh, see, I'm sorry. I'm talking too much as usual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shorter answers, right? Yeah, you are authoritarian. <laughs> First of all, I don't, I don't think it's got to do anything with modern America. I mean, it's always been the case, and it's perfectly good reasons for it, and the reasons go back to Hume's insight. I mean, you tell people the truth, it's, you're in trouble. Uh, why should you do it? So therefore, you try to control their opinion. That means mostly lie or mislead or distort and so on. What's the method for overcoming it? I mean, we all know that. What's the point of asking? We all know exactly what the method is. Try to find it. Be honest. Be honest, try to find, figure out the truth to your, for yourself, work with others to try to figure it out, try to disseminate it. It's not a big trick. I mean, like if any of you take science courses, like this tech biology, yeah, what do you try to do in a biology course? Well, you try to find out the truth. If it happens to undermine what somebody else believed, well, fine, it undermines it. That's the way the game's played. In the nat and there's a little certain tiny sector of uh, academic life, namely the natural sciences, in which this is just taken for granted. And the reason it's taken for granted is if you don't do it, you get nowhere, you know, and you get, and somebody else does it, and you're out of business. But in most fields of humanities and social sciences and so on, you don't have that kind of external discipline, you know. Mother Nature isn't standing there forcing you to be honest. Uh, and therefore, there's a lot of opportunity for, and a lot of latitude for uh, distortion and dis deceit. But the same techniques that are used in the sciences ought to be used here, and there's nothing you know, there's no big secret about them. You know, everybody knows how to be honest. You know, everybody knows how to try to find out what's actually going on. I mean, you have to have experience. You know, you have to see what kind of deceit there's been in the past, and you, know, you have to know what to look for, and so on. But, you know, these aren't esoteric skills. You know, this isn't quantum physics. I mean, this kind of stuff is available to everybody. That's why peasants and illiterate peasants in Latin America were able to do it very easily or workers in, uh, you know, Lowell, Massachusetts, 150 years ago. It's because it's obvious. This, I mean, the skills are deceit. There's not much skill involved in being honest. In fact, a lot of your university, and you know, school and university training is teaching you how to carry out the skills of distortion and deceit. That's hard. It's much harder to tell lies and tell the truth. I mean, everybody knows that from their own lives. You know, you want to tell the truth about something you did, it's usually pretty easy. If you want to try to justify some rotten thing you did by making up lies, it's usually pretty hard. And that's true whether it's that, you know, you stole a toy from your three-year-old brother or anything else. Uh, telling the truth is always very easy, except for the personal cost that may be associated. But there's no skills to learn. How? Well, just 
take any day's paper and you're just deluged with it. Uh, you have to ask, what's the relationship between what's being described and what in fact is happening? Okay, so, uh, uh, I don't know, I was just looking at the New York Times while I was eating breakfast, and it's full of examples. You can start with page one and run right through. Uh, so, for example, there's, there's a lot of discussion about anti-politics. You know, there's this great mood of anti-politics in the country. Well, interestingly, they actually quote somebody who tells the truth, some working class person who says, yeah, Congress is rotten, and the reason is Congress is big business. Okay, that's true. The reason why Congress is rotten is because Congress is big business, and big business runs the country, and that's rotten. But try to find that discussed somewhere. So that means the, the problem isn't anti-politics. You know, it's not opposition to government. It's not the stuff that's in all the headlines, anti-politics. The problem is the authoritarian control uh, that happens to uh, use uh, politics as its medium. So you're supposed to see the politics, and, you know, but not see the control that's hidden behind. Well, you know, that's uh, actually it's obvious to this guy they quoted, but that's hidden, you know. Uh, all right, there's one example, or take the article on Haiti. Uh, actually, actually, a good reporter down there, John Kiffner of the New York Times, is quite, he's actually the guy who exposed the uh, police raid against the, the police assassination of Hampton. Uh, he was never able to publish much about it, like the Times Magazine wouldn't run a story that he wrote about it. He was a young reporter then, and he exposed the lies. The uh, Chicago Press was simply reporting the police lies. Uh, but he actually went to the room and noticed that the gunshots were all inside, not outside, and exposed it. And he's a pretty good reporter. I suspect that's one reason he never gets anywhere on the New York Times. Like, he's the one older reporter who's never been a bureau chief or anything like that. Anyhow, he's an honest reporter, and when he goes somewhere, he usually tells the truth. Okay, so he's in Haiti now, and he's telling the truth. I mean, the truth is that uh, the American forces there, uh, the Haitians have been told, you're not supposed to take revenge. You know, in other words, impunity reigns. Those were our killers, and you're not allowed to go after them. No justice. That's the rule. Uh, but so the Haitians are doing it. You know, like they're finding these attaches, these murderers, you know, the paramilitaries who the security forces use to do most of their dirty work. And they're handing them over to the American army, because that's what they're told to do by Aristide and others. Just don't kill them, you know, hand them over to the American army. So what's the American army doing? Well, it's handing them over to the Haitian police. You know, that is the guys they always worked with and worked for. I mean, it's like, you know, taking some Nazi killer and handing him over to the Gestapo to take care of him. That's exa so, of course, what happens is the Haitian police release him. Uh, and, in fact, uh, Kiffner points out there that, you know, they're supposed to have gone to the National Penitentiary, but then he checked at the National Penitentiary and they're not there, you know. Well, what happened? You know, you don't have to be a big genius to figure it out. All right, if you read through this, you, you begin to understand exactly what the U.S. invasion is about. I mean, it's about maintaining the traditional power structure, including its military apparatus, which we set up in the first place. Now, that's not what the headline says. You know, you have to sort of read it with uh, minimal intelligence to figure out that that's what it means. And if you go, or take this a big story on North Korea, you know, Clinton, huge foreign policy triumph. Uh, Clinton. Uh, succeeded in getting North Korea to shift its uh, nuclear weapons production over to some other form of production. Uh, minor footnote, that's exactly what Korea's been, North Korea's been asking for for the last couple of years. You know? uh, and in fact, you don't have to go very far to find that out here. You can go down the street to Northwestern University where they have the, I happened to meet him at breakfast this morning, there's a friend of mine named Bruce Cummings who's the world's, you know, the leading expert on Korea in the United States. He's been pointing this out for years, but he can't get into the press, even though he's the major, he's the major American specialist on Korea, you know, the guy who wrote the big, fat, thousand-page books and so on. But he can't get interviewed, can't get in the press. Why? Well, because he's been saying exactly what's been obvious, uh, and which is now presented as a great triumph of American diplomacy, because, you know, ultimately, after having waved fists around and, you know, gotten near war and had military maneuvers, we finally, finally turned out to be politically expedient to do it. Okay, that's another story. And we can just go on from there, you know. You ask how it's done, take a look at any column in the newspaper, you'll figure out how it's done. And in fact, read your textbooks, and you'll find out the same thing, because they're not very different. Uh, I don't know who's calling on people, are you? Yeah, okay. Well, 
I don't know the answer to that, but I think there is one thing that we can predict with fair certainty. If the U.S. public remains marginalized, there isn't going to be much history to worry about. Uh, because the, uh, you know, we're not living in the 18th century. The problems may be sort of similar, but they're quite different in scale. And the problems that are not very far away have to do with human survival. Uh, and hence, if the public in the most powerful country in the world remains marginalized, we don't have to worry much about history because there isn't going to be any. Uh, so like take, say, Central America, which is the region that we've been most, we have most control. We've controlled it for 100 years, so that tells us really what we are. It's quite possible that much of Central America will be uninhabitable in another couple of decades like uh, Nicaragua, for example, which is one of the main targets of our attack. Actually, we attacked Nicaragua first in 1854. That's when the U.S. Navy first shelled in Nicaragua. And it's been that way since then, so we have a lot of influence there. Uh, it's losing its water supply. Uh, re it's not, it's, the reason is that uh, people are so desperate after these, the American attacks, which intensified in the 80s, uh, that they're starving and they're going up to doing the only thing they can. You know, you go up in the hills to cut wood and try to find some land to work and so on. That eliminates the forest cover. Streams start drying up. Uh, the land can't absorb water. Uh, lakes are drying up. Uh, there, there's on top, it happens to be a drought, but uh, the water supply may disappear. And as the pressures continue, it may become a desert. That could be true of Haiti. Haiti, in fact, is kind of like a, almost a parable of Western savagery. I mean, when, when Columbus landed, that was the first place Haiti, uh, Columbus landed, Haiti, and he thought it was a paradise. You know, it was the richest place in the world, also probably the most densely populated place in the world. Uh, and in fact, it remained that way. I mean, France is a rich country because, in large measure, because they stole Haiti's resources. Haiti was the richest colony in the world right through the 18th century. In fact, early in this century, right before Woodrow Wilson invaded Haiti, uh, you look at the American government studies and so on, scholarship, they were still describing Haiti as a major resource center. Uh, it, was a, it happened to be an extremely rich place. Well, when you fly into Haiti today, uh, you know, you, as you fly in, you see that the island, the island is Haiti and Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic we've also brutalized, but Haiti much more so. When you fly over the border, you see it. On one side, it's brown. On the other side, it's sort of semi-green. The brown side is Haiti, the richest place in the world. You know. uh, it may not last another decade or more, uh, and uh, literally, it may become totally uninhabitable. Uh, and that's extending elsewhere. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, it involves us too, you know, like the rich and the powerful are going to survive longer. But uh, these effects are very real, uh, and uh, they're, they're getting worse. You know, they're getting worse as more and more people are getting marginalized. I mean, the, the percentage of the world's population that has no role in profit-making is increasing. And if profit-making is the only human value, that part of the population, bigger and bigger here too, uh, is going to become destructive because there's nothing else for them to do. And when you're destructive these days, it's not like being destructive uh, 200 years ago. The techniques of destruction are vastly escalated. Uh, the environmental problems, for example, are much more significant in scale. I mean, there are, nobody really understands much about th complicated things like, you know, the weather and so on. But there's a fair possibility, I mean, a, a possibility high enough so that no rational person would exclude it, that within a couple hundred years, uh, uh, the water level, the world's water level, will have risen high enough so that most of human life will have been destroyed. Well, you know, we don't do anything about that. That's it's not impossible that that'll happen. In fact, it's even likely. Uh, so the answer is, if you remain marginalized, there's not going to be much history to worry about. And whether people will react or not, who knows? That's free. You know, everyone's got to decide.
I don't think so. In fact, American history has been rather different. I mean, look, there's a lot of problems. The, the political system was, in fact, set up uh, as, as very anti-democratic. You have to remember, all the founding fathers hated democracy. Jefferson was a partial exception, but only partial. But uh, for the most part, they hated democracy. Uh, and uh, the U.S. didn't even become formally democratic until about the mid-19th century. Uh, the original idea was that, the, I'm quoting now, the people who own the country ought to govern it. That was the favorite maxim of John Jay, the first chief, uh, you know, head of, the, what do you call him, chief, chief justice of the Supreme Court, and, you know, head of the Constitutional Convention and so on. The people who own the country ought to govern it. That was the principle on which the country was founded. Uh, but if you look at the way it worked over the years, it turned out very often that concentration of power in Washington empowered people as distinct from concentration of power in states. And there were reasons for that. Uh, businesses in power, the people who own the country are there everywhere. Uh, but in states, locally, they're often more, more powerful. And they can often concentrate more power in the states than they can in the federal government where, let's say, national popular movements were able to influence them. So if you look at some of the things that really improved the country, like, uh, you know, in the, say, the New Deal measures, which sort of brought the United States into the, partially at least, into the main framework of industrial society, uh, most of that was coming from Washington and against the states. Uh, and in fact, it was com if you really look at who was behind it, it was often big business as opposed to small business. Like big corporations like, say, General Electric, uh, who were, had small labor forces and they were very capital intensive and had international orientations, they were supporting New Deal measures. Uh, the mainstream business was opposing them. It was labor intensive and it wasn't internationalized. And for a corporation like GE, uh, it was better to have an organized workforce that didn't carry out wildcat strikes and that uh, you, know, you could be sure it was going to work pretty regularly, even if you paid them a little more money because they weren't labor intensive anyway. Uh, and the combination of centralized big business and powerful popular movements operating through Washington was able to overcome the more distributed power of private power that was in the state. Well, you know, those are things that happen in societies based on power, you know, power structures. So I don't think it's true that uh, centralization is I mean, centralization is a bad thing in principle, but not when you have private power. When you have private power, centralization can sometimes be a good thing, although ultimately it's a bad thing and you want to decentralize, but only after other structures of power are dismantled. And you can see it from American history. You know, you really look at the details of American history, you see this working out. Quite commonly, uh, the central power, the power of the central government has been able to overcome the private power, which is more decentralized, in the interests of the population. Not always, but sometimes. So I don't think there are any simple formulas about that. The real problem is the private power. Time for one more question. I grew up watching the 6 o'clock news, the New York Times, out of the box. An innocent curiosity to find out what, what was really going on. In my ignorance, I believed that that perception of, of um, world events was the real one. And um, now I find out that it's not, and that there are many other hidden things going on. My question I put to you today is, how do I identify the real sources? And Because um, you obviously have access to sources that I, I just That's not true. Through. I don't have access to anything you don't have access to. There's no secrets in this game. And furthermore, there is no method other than the method that you would pursue if you were taking a biology class or a chemistry class. You have to try to figure out how to evaluate evidence. And that's just a skill that you learn. I mean, when you're doing the natural sciences, that's what it's about, you know. It's like apprenticeship. You pick up the skill of trying to figure out how to evaluate evidence and test theories and see what makes sense and so on. You do the same thing in ordinary life. Uh, you can't, there is no source you can go to that's going to tell you the truth. Ultimately, you rely on your own critical faculties, period. There's nothing more to say about it. I mean, you should take for granted that any powerful institution, like, say, the New York Times or the 6 o'clock news, is obviously going to try to mislead and control you. I mean, that should be a truism. What are they in business for? You know? Are they in business to, to try to undermine themselves? 
I mean, these are big corporate structures. Are they in business to try to help people undermine them? You know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out they're not doing that. They're in business to try to make you passive and obedient, just like the school system is, which has the same power source. That should be understood by everybody. Now that in itself doesn't get you an avenue to truth, but it tells you where to start. Start by being very skeptical about anything that comes to you from any sort of power system. And in fact, you should also be skeptical about everything else. You should be skeptical about what I'm telling you. Why should you believe a word of it? You know, I got my own ax to grind. So figure it out for yourself, you know. And there is no other answer, any more than there is when you're studying science. Like when I teach, my, like tomorrow I'm going to be teaching graduate courses at MIT, and, you know, students know that they're not supposed to believe me. If they believe me, they, they're not going to, you know, we wouldn't even pass them. You know, they have to challenge what they hear and figure out what's wrong with it and, you know, do it better and so on. In the natural sciences, that's taken for granted. Actually, that's one reason I like MIT and stay there. It doesn't have the atmosphere of the humanities and the social sciences. It has the atmosphere of the natural sciences. And even though the people can be extremely reactionary, it's a much more honest place, just because you're driven by the values of the natural sciences. And everybody should be. You know, that's just ordinary rationality. I don't think you have to teach it to people either. I think you have to beat it out of their heads. Like, I think children understand it. That's the last, that's the last question. That's all we have time for. So take all your questions. Be disobedient in your classes uh, the rest of the semester. Thank you for coming. Okay. Uh, Okay. Yeah, we can be a little, yeah, we'll be a little late. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. I'll try to be briefer. Okay, let's not waste any time. Questions? <laughs> you picking? Or, yeah. Well, I, the last group you mentioned briefly is that classical liberalism is very anti capitalist. And I got a sense of what you're referring to, but if you could briefly expand on that. Actually, I'm going to be talking about that in the thing later, and I will expand on it a lot. But if you think about classical liberalism, it was based on the idea of, I mean, like, for example, why was Adam Smith in favor of markets? He was in favor of markets. He gave a kind of a complicated argument for markets, but at the core of it was the idea that uh, if you had perfect liberty, markets would lead to perfect equality. And that's why he was in favor of markets, uh, because he thought that people ought to be completely equal, completely equal. And that the reason is that his, he being a classical liberal, he recognized that people's fundamental character involved notions like sympathy and solidarity and right to control their own work and so on and so forth. It's all the exact opposite of capitalism. You know, in fact, there's, there are no two points of view more antithetical than classical liberalism and capitalism. Uh, that's why when the University of Chicago publishes a bicentennial edition of Smith, they have to distort the text, which they did. In fact, if you read George Stigler's introduction to the Bicentennial Edition, it's diametrically opposed to the text on point after point. I mean, the extent of the distortion, this is a scholarly edition, you know, University of Chicago, Bicentennial, so it's kind of interesting to look at it. For example, you know, Smith is famous for what he wrote about the vision of labor. He's supposed to have thought that the vision of labor was a great thing. Well, he didn't. He thought the vision of labor was a terrible thing. Uh, and in fact, he says that uh, in any civilized country, uh, society, the government is going to have to intervene to prevent division of labor from simply destroying people. Well, take a look at the index, you know, detailed index for this scholarly edition of Adam Smith, and you find that, and take a look under um, division of labor, you won't find an entry for that passage. It's not there in the index. Okay, well, you know, that's real scholarship. I mean, suppress the facts totally you know, and present them as the opposite of what they are and figure probably nobody's going to read the page 473 anyhow, because I didn't. You know, ask those guys who edited it if they ever read the page 473. Answer, well, they probably read the first paragraph and then sort of remembered what they'd been taught in, you know, some college course.
set the possibility that this kind of analysis is valid. That's right. How do you bridge that gap? I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's true. You're absolutely right. I mean, they've lived through their whole life being taught to obey authority. When you tried to question things, you were beaten down or kicked out. I mean, we all went through schools, you know, and like I remember my own schooling. If the history teacher told you something you thought was pretty stupid and you raised your hand and you said, I don't agree with that, I think it's wrong, you're going to be sent to the principal or some bad thing had happened to you, you know. On the other hand, if you just copy down whatever idiocy he said and then regurgitate it on the next exam and then forget about it, you were okay. And you learn that very quickly, you know. And it, it ends up with a kind of both, it per, 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 it changes people. You become obedient. The other thing is it filters people. People who aren't obedient get in real trouble. I mean, I've, I, I taught children too, you know, children, I mean. And you can see, I mean, there are some who just don't take your word for it. Uh, and the, you know, the kind of very unfortunate tendency is to try to beat them down because they're a pain in the neck, you know. Uh, but what they ought to be is encouraged. Uh, yeah, why well, take my word for it? You know, who the heck am I? You know, so figure it out. You know, uh, I was lucky to go to a progressive school when I was a kid. I went to a Dewey Eight experimental school, and there it was done routinely. Little ch children were encouraged to challenge everything, and you sort of worked on your own. You're supposed to think things through. It was a real experience. You know, in fact, it was quite a striking change when I went to the. Uh, I went there from about age you know, one and a half up till 12. Uh, and then I went, it ended, you know, I went to the city high school, which was the pride of the city system. You know, the one, what's called these days a magnet school. You know, like the one school for academically oriented kids who are gonna work on their own anyway. So naturally it had the worst teachers. You know, it was considered the sinecure of the system. If you were tired of teaching, you could go to that school because those kids are gonna study anyhow. They all wanna get into college. Uh, and it was the dumbest, most ridiculous place I've ever been. It was like falling into a black hole or something. But the move, the transition was so sharp, you know, it really made an, had an effect. In fact, that was the first time I learned I was a good student. You know, when I, it was very competitive, of course, because yeah, it's one of the ways of controlling people is making things very competitive. So everybody's ranked, you know. And you know exactly where you are. Are you third in the class? Or maybe you move up to, down to fourth or something like that. And the, all of this is in kid, people's heads, you know. Uh, and so I quickly suddenly learned I'm a good student. The issue had never arisen in 12 years of schooling, 10 years of schooling before that, because everybody was, you know, encouraged to do what they, you know, do their best and you sort of help people and stuff like that. So the question never come up, you know. As soon as you get into these systems, immediately you're ranked, it's competitive, you gotta beat down the guy next to you. Uh, and all of those are techniques of enforced obedience. There's nothing necessary about them. I mean, there are other kinds of schooling which don't have them. You know, in fact, I know because I went through it. In fact, as a teacher, I was also teaching in that framework, you know, with a kind of Dewey educational framework. And it can certainly be done. You know, it's, it's not very remote from our experience. You know, it's like very close. Uh, but how you break it down after 10 years of, 15 years of going through this stuff, that's hard. Actually, it's hard in the sciences. You know, one of the things you have to teach people in science, you go to a place like MIT, say, where I teach, I mean, students have to learn that it doesn't matter. In fact, like, there's a, the, you know, one of the most famous physicists in the world, a guy named Vicky Weisskopf, who just retired, you know, really super physicist. Uh, he used to always teach the freshman courses at MIT in physics, and uh, he was famous for saying, on the first day, you know, students would ask him, uh, what are we going to cover? And he would answer, it doesn't matter what you cover, it matters what you discover, you know. So we're not going to bother with facts. You can read a book and find them out. We're going to learn how to discover things. You know? Well, yeah, that's what you have to teach people in sciences. And, and when you get to a high-level place like MIT, it's mostly an apprenticeship. You know, kind of, science is like learning how to be a carpenter. I mean, you work with somebody who somehow knows how to do it, and you kind of get the idea, and you have the intuitions. And, maybe the professor makes up the facts as he goes along because if they're wrong you can look up a handbook and get them right. It's not important. And that's the same sort of thing that has to be done in other fields. What do you think about 
Black English and advanced and slower students being taught together so that no one's some of the same centers and, and all that kind of stuff. What do you, what do you think about that? It's interesting that it's called new methods. I mean, those are the old methods. You know? Like tracking is a new thing. It's re I don't know exactly when it starts, but if some of you are in education, you can tell me. But I know that tracking, you know, breaking kids into several tracks at the early stages, that's something new. Like when my, it wasn't true when I was a kid. Everybody was together. I mean, you didn't know who was a slow learner, who was a fast learner. You know, you just learned. You know, you helped each other and stuff. Uh, the, uh, when my kids were in school, by the time they were in third grade, they were ranking every friend of theirs as smart and dumb. Why? Because some of the smart ones, they were told, this guy's smart, he's in third grade, you know, he's in the top track. This one's dumb, you know, he's in the low track and somebody else in the middle track. I mean, you know, this is mind-boggling, but this is something new. So going back to putting what are called slow learners, meaning just people who are interested in different things and whatever else they do, in one place, uh, yeah, that's kind of obvious. You know? uh, in fact, most educational resources should be going to people who are you know, having some problems who can't just do it on their own or who don't come from a family where it's all done for them anyhow. I mean, most of what you learn, you learn at home, you know. And those of us who were lucky enough to come from, you know, families that valued education or had resources or were, you know, so on, you, well, you just do it on your own, I mean, no matter how rotten the teaching is. But there are kids who don't have those advantages and they're the ones who would have the, uh, you know, the resources. Uh, as to teaching in black English, that's a, that's a tricky question. It's like teaching an in, uh, black English is just another language, you know. I mean, if black people owned the corporations, black English would be considered mainstream English, and what you and I talk would be called some weird dialect, you know. Uh, this is just a question of who owns who owns the place. It's just another language, you know. And uh, the the question of whether to teach in a, in the native language or in a foreign language is always a tricky question, in any society. Like, for example, take, say, Germany, modern society. Uh, most of the people in Germany don't speak German. They have to be taught German. Uh, and uh, 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 now it's less true than it was a generation ago, but a generation ago it was completely true. I mean, a person from Bavaria and a person from northwest Germany couldn't even understand each other. They not the same language. They all had to be taught German, the standard language. Uh, and then a question arises. Do you teach the schools in their actual language, which may be Bavarian, or do you teach the schools in the standard language that you're trying to inculcate into them uh, because it's a technique of advancement and a way of getting into the larger society and so on? And those are conflicts of goals. I don't think there's an easy answer to them. There's an advantage to studying in your native language. Uh, naturally, you, know, you want to learn how to read. It's easier to learn in your native language than in a foreign language. On the other hand, there's a disadvantage to learning in your native language, and then we are going to be re more remote from the centers of power. And you have to figure out how to evaluate that. Uh, and black English is just a special case of it. And we call it black English. It's just another, it's just another language. Like where I grew up in Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia was like the first stop north on the south, you know, when former slaves came up from the south, they stopped in Philadelphia. And I mean, like, uh, you know, I'd ride in the streetcars, there'd be kids sitting behind me, I don't understand a word they were saying. Literally not one word they were saying. They were just talking another language, you know. It's uh, what we call black English, you know. I was talking white English, a different language. Uh, but they're just two languages, you know. It's like French and German. There's no question, no further question about them. If you have a French kid in a German school, uh, should they be taught in French or in German? Well, you know. There are advantages both ways. I'm curious uh, what you think about, what, for instance, some of the great leaders of the change, like that in spiritual leaders, Martin Luther King, or Mahatma Gandhi, or Dalai Lama. And you don't seem to mention uh, that when you speak. I mean, it seems like it's these co ops or uh, you know, corner grocery store or something like that. But looking at change they have brought on. Well, let's take Martin Luther King. See, I, don't, I think Martin Luther King was an important person, but I don't think he was a big agent of change. Uh, in fact, I think Martin Luther King was able to play a role in bringing about change because the real agents of change were doing the work. And the real agents of change were like SNCC workers. SNCC workers. I mean, you know, the, the real agents of change usually fall out of history. Okay, because we have a way of 
you know, there's a way of distort, it's, it's necessary to distort history, to make it look as if, you know, great men were doing things. That's what, part of the way of teaching people, you can't do anything, you're helpless. You gotta wait for some great man to come around, he'll do it for you. That's part of the technique of disempowering people. But if you take a look at the civil rights movement, that's recent, we can look at it. Uh, it began with actually black students mostly. Or, or uh, actually, you know, take, take say Rosa Parks. I mean, the story about Rosa Parks is, you know, this courageous black woman suddenly decided I had enough, I'm not gonna sit in the back of the bus, which is sort of half true, but only half true. Rosa Parks came from a community um, a community, a well-organized community, which ultimately, in fact, has Communist Party roots, if you trace it back. It was a big, it was a community of people who were working together uh, and had, in fact, decided on a plan as to how to break through this system. And she was, in fact, part of the agent of that plan, Highlander School and so on and so forth. Well, all of that's out of history, you know. What's in history is one person had courage to do something, which she did, you know, but not on her own. Nobody does anything on their own. I mean, she was coming out of an organized community of committed people who had been working together for a very long time. Uh, uh, Martin Luther King was able to appear and give speeches because SNCC workers had, and Freedom Riders and so on had prepared the ground and taken a brutal beating for it. And these were incidentally pretty privileged kids, many of them. They chose it, you know, they didn't have to do it. Uh, uh, and <clears throat> they're the civil rights movement. Uh, Martin Luther King was important because he could stand up there and get cameras. You know. I think he probably saw it this way. At least I hope he did. He should have seen it this way. Uh, Gandhi is the same story. He has a very mixed record. Uh, if you look at, you know, he was, in favor, he was doing all sorts of things. But it was the people who were doing the work on the ground who prepared the basis for Gandhi to sort of articulate things. Uh, and uh, if you look at real movements, I think it's always like that. Well, I think a third party, or fourth or fifth or whatever party, probably makes a lot of sense in the United States. I mean, it's really a second party. We only have one party as it now stands. We have a kind of a business party with several factions. And countries that have a, a kind of a labor-based party, you know, a popular party, uh, have, there's things that can be done. It's not, a, you know, it's not a huge change. I mean, almost every other country has this. Uh, but it does offer some options. So I say take say Canada right next door, a very similar country to ours, but different in some respects. One of the respects is, it, is the labor movement still exists. Another respect is it does have a popular-based party, the NDP, which is kind of mildly social democratic. Now, when the NDP gets into office, they do exactly the same thing as the other parties. I mean, they're indistinguishable. But they nevertheless are a kind of like an umbrella party in which labor and women's groups and others can sort of get together and work together and so on. So they can, you know, they can press for particular issues that are of general interest. And you see the difference between Canada and the United States just for that reason. Like take say health. Uh, in the United States where there is no political party, just the business party, uh, certain sectors of the population have been able to get health care for themselves, like the UAW. You know, some of the stronger unions were able to get pretty decent health care arrangements. The way it worked was that they were given those things in, instead of salary raises, you know. So, like my, my university, we got good health care. All right, it was sort of given instead of raising salaries one year. You know, that's the way it was done. Uh, so you can get health, so if you're well enough organized and strong enough, you can get health care for yourself. But what happened in Canada is that those same groups the labor, labor movement, did not just get health care for themselves, they got it for the population. And they were able to do that because there was in fact a political structure through which they could work, which, met, which satisfied common interests, not just their local interests. Lacking that in the United States has never happened. Uh, now, you know, a, a, a second party that is a kind of a populist party doesn't make a big change in the society. As I say, every other society that's like us has one. Uh, but it isn't a step forward. And in that sense, what's called a third party really should be called a second party makes some, some sense. Uh, there was the second part, which I, oh, running for that, I'm not going for
Congress. I mean, I, you know, they, my department wouldn't even let me be department chairman because I'd probably ruin everything in three seconds, you know. <laughs> This, these, uh, if you can hear, this was things like, uh, what about alternatives like, say, internet and you know, electronic communication and so on, which have, which aren't directly under the control of. They're, they're just, not, they're not just big corporations like the media are. So therefore, might have other options. Uh, it's a complicated question, and I think it's an interesting, very interesting question. It'll be interesting to see how it works itself out in the next couple of years. The uh, uh, as you, you correctly said, the internet is for a special sector of society. The internet's for the wealthy. You know. You have to be rich enough to, uh, or privileged enough to be able to get into it. Yeah, I, but that's wealthy. You know, I mean, I can, professors like to complain about how bad their salaries are, but they're like up in the stratosphere and getting much too highly paid, in my opinion, by the standards of the general population, including me. But uh, the, uh, uh, the fact is that you've got to be part of the relatively privileged part of the population before you're even part of this thing, you know. Uh, now, for that privileged part of the population, remember that this is a taxpayer-supported operation. So it's just part of the general public subsidy to the rich. You know, uh, it's run through. The, it was actually started through the Pentagon, which is just the, the way of funneling public resources to the rich. Uh, it's there now, and it's like a lot of things. It has a mixed character. So, for example, if I was, I'm sure that there's a lot of thinking going on. You can be certain about whether to allow the internet to exist. Uh, part, of the, it, part of the problem with it, from the point of view of powerful interests, is it's just too democratic. It's very hard to control what's in it. You know? In fact, I have a daughter in Nicaragua, and the only way I was able to, there was no, you couldn't call telephone or anything during the war period. The only way I could contact her was through the Pentagon. You know? Because the ARPANET, you know, which is the core of this thing, which is basically a Pentagon system, uh, I'm in it because I'm in MIT, and somebody there was in it because I don't know why. And you could sort of set up email connections between, say, me and my daughter in Managua during the Reagan War through the Pentagon. Okay, well, you know, that's uh, the kind of thing that happened. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like that, obviously. And they don't like the fact that you can get the GATT Treaty and you can get the latest news on, I mean, like stuff that I've been talking about, almost all of it you can find on the Internet if you look. So that's bad. you got to stop that. Uh, yeah, that's Kenya. No email to Cuba. It's interesting. Actually, it's almost cut off to Nicaragua, but not quite. You know, there's still one or two connections. Uh, but uh, yeah, Cuba's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, the uh, uh, so that on the other hand, it has other advantages. Uh, it it diverts people. From, it atomizes people. When you're sitting in front of your tube, you're alone. You know, I mean, there's something about human beings that makes face-to-face -face contact very different from banging on a computer and getting some noise coming back. That's very impersonal, you know, and it breaks down personal relations. And that's a good part of it from the point of view of power because it makes people less human. And a very important thing is to drive human sentiments out of people. Uh, so if you can eliminate things like face-to-face -face contact and, you know, direct interaction and so on and just, you know, turn people into sort of like what's caricatured as a kind of MIT nerd, you know, somebody who's kind of got an antenna coming out of his head and is wired into his computer. If you can turn everybody into that, it's sort of an advantage because then you've really made people even more inhuman and therefore more controllable and so on. And there's other complicated things like, see, one thing I've noticed recently, I don't know if you've noticed this, David, is that uh, a lot of activists uh, are dropping subscriptions to journal to left journals. Why? Because they can get it through the internet. Well, now if I was in the CIA, I would be saying, look, let's let this thing go, you know, because even if they get the 
it'll, it's true that it has the negative effect of allowing people to get more information, but it has the positive effect of destroying alternative institutions. Okay, so therefore, let's let it go. You know, because when these guys stop the, their subscriptions to, you know, I don't know, Z Magazine or something, then that's going to destroy that institution, and that'll separate people even more. So if there's anybody, I doubt there's anyone in the CIA with this much brains, you know. But if they had enough brains, they would say, let's let the thing go, because it'll probably destroy the dissident institutions. And it'll destroy them because we're so antisocial that we don't see the point of supporting institutions. Everybody's out for themselves, remember. That's what you taught from childhood. Even if I on the left, you still have that ingrained. Like you're an activist, you still have ingrained in your head, I'm out for myself. And therefore, if I can get the information for nothing, why should I help build an institution? That's a very anti-social attitude. But you find it, you know, it's very hard to break out of it. I mean, we're just got it. So, you know, it's got that character. Uh, the other, the long-term tendency of the internet, my suspicion is, is it will be like some article I read somewhere, I forget, maybe the Wall Street Journal or something, which was describing the great potential of this thing. And it went something like this. It said that this is interactive, you know. Uh, so it said, well, here's the kind of thing you can look forward to. They're really up very, there's an upbeat account. It said, um, everybody's going to have this, everybody's going to be tied into it, uh, and we'll be able to have people really interacting in a new way. And then it described, gave two examples of how it could work, one for women, one for men. Uh, for women, uh, they could be sitting there, you know, in front of all their equipment, and uh, on 83 home shopping channels, you know, models show up saying, waving something and uh, sort of giving you the message, you better have that or else something terrible will happen to you. So they can say, okay, I better have that. And then they can push a button, that's the interactive part. And 10 minutes later, you know, something's delivered at the front door. Okay, that's women interactive. What about men? They said, well, men, you know, like the red blooded thing to do for men is like watching the Super Bowl. Now, now when you watch the Super Bowl, it's completely passive. You just drink a beer and that sort of thing. But now it's going to be interactive. So before the, you know, the quarterback's in a huddle and all that sort of thing, and uh, the interactive part will be, you'll, there'll be a message flashed out to all the red-blooded men, and they'll be supposed to say, look, here's what I think the next play ought to be. Like, I think it ought to be a pass, you know. And you push a button and it says pass. Uh, and then after the quarterback calls the play, he's not listening to you, of course. Uh, or the coach actually calls the play, I guess, and tells the quarterback. The, uh, 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 it'll be flashed on the screen, you know, 63% thought it should have been a pass and so on. That's the interactive part for men. Uh, so everybody's really involved now in society, you know, like women buying stuff they don't want and spending money and men, you know, becoming even more imbecilic than they're already made to be and so on. Uh, and that's, that's all to the good because that's a way of controlling people. And if you just, if you let the thing run, that's where it's going to go, something like that. On the other hand, it does have alternatives. Actually, some of them are being fought about right in Chicago, right now. Uh, there's a community-based group, uh, Chicago Media Network or something, which involves uh, Afro-American Afro journalists and uh, teacher, teachers union and others who are trying to get an alternative cable channel, a community-based cable channel. Well, I was just told yesterday we were sort of beaten down in a court somewhere and they're now filing another court suit. But that's the kind of thing that could happen. Now, unless they get support, they're going to lose. You know? uh, if they get public support, they're going to win. And that's exactly the way these things work. You know, you, you will get uh, public. You, these things can be useful, for, very important, as alternative sources. In fact, as the only sources, you know, as the real public sources, if people are willing to fight for them. If they're not willing to fight for them, they'll end up with uh, home shopping and the Super Bowl. And you're seeing an example of it right here, right in front of you, uh, on this, uh, in this Chicago media action group. And get involved, you can make a change. Forget about it, nothing will happen. The guys who are always, there's some groups who are always fighting. Big business is always fighting. They don't stop. You know? uh, and if other people aren't involved in the struggle, they win.
that say, for example, many on the left, including yourself, don't have a practice. And that is part, partly related, of course, to the absence of the Labour Party in the United States. But also the proposition that the reason why there is a difficulty in organizing on the left in the United States is because the ideology, the ideology of racism is so perversive in the United States that uh, it prevents organization uh, among the people who are, of course, who have the most reasons to be dissatisfied uh, with the system. And therefore, I'm implicitly criticizing the left as well. There's racism on the left. And one point that has been made about uh, the distribution of power in the world, especially as it relates to communication, is that if, and this is, comes in the form of uh, an anecdote, if, if Hemingway was uh, Turkish, no one would have heard of Hemingway. My proposition is, uh, if Chomsky was black, would anyone have heard of Chomsky? Or would he just be dismissed as another black man with a chip on the shoulder who is just concerned about black issues? I don't know. I mean, the, let's take the publisher that I mainly publish with, South End. Uh, the main seller in South End happens to be Bell Hooks, a uh, black woman. Uh, the, uh, the, if you go down a little, it's people like, I'm one of them, but Manning Marable is another, you know, black intellectual. Uh, I don't, I mean, look, the fact that there's plenty of racism in society, and it's in the left too, you know, absolutely, nobody's going to argue that. Of course there is. Uh, but I don't see why it can't be overcome. Like, take, it can't be overcome. And I think there have been attempts to overcome it. Like, take the Panthers. Uh, one of the reasons why Fred Hampton was killed was that he was opening up things to uh, poor whites. And in fact, to whites generally. I mean, like, I was at Fred Hampton's funeral. You know, and possibly, possibly. I mean, Martin Luther King was popular, you know, First of all, Martin Luther King was opposed, strongly opposed, like the Kennedy administration really disliked him, and they tried to block him in every possible way, but it finally got to the point where they couldn't stop it any longer, so they pretended they liked him. Uh, but then, and there was a period of sort of popularity for King when he was seen to be focusing on extremely narrow issues, you know, like racist sheriffs in the South and so on. Okay, we can be against that. As soon as Martin Luther King turned to broader issues, uh, whether it was the Vietnam War or the poor, remember the Poor People's March was the last one, he became, you know, a pariah. Now, I don't know whether that's why he was killed or not, but he certainly became a pariah uh, because he was just focusing on general issues. Uh, and the, the couple of years, a year or two, about that time, the Panthers were getting organized. And in fact, the Panthers were unusual for an urban-based black group in that they were trying to reach out and did so. There were good connections. I mean, it was a tricky business because the Panthers were like other, you know, any group that's coming out of urban society is going to be a big mixture. So like the Panthers had criminal elements, they had hustlers, they had serious organizers. It was like a mixture of everything. The ones who survived, incidentally, the criminal elements because the police didn't care much about them. But the, or the Hampton types were destroyed and they were, they had uh, white black, I was with a white, mainly white group, resist which had good contacts with the Panthers back in the late 60s. Like I say, I was invited to the funeral. There was no reason why this couldn't continue, except that, you know, wasn't able to resist outside force. So the racism is certainly there, and you've got to watch it. But uh, I don't, you know, it doesn't seem to me it can't be overcome, you know. Well, that's because, but he presents himself that. Now, look, that's not fair. Look, Manning Marable presents himself that way. It's not that anybody else presents him that way. Is that the value of his analysis cuts across racial lines. Sure, but the people who read him understand that. Pardon me? People who read him understand that, and they accept his picture of himself as an African-American intellectual, which is correct. That's his picture of himself. You know, I respect that and you recognize that it holds generally. And look, that's been true of the left for a long time. I take somebody like C.L.R. James. Well, you know, he was a left intellectual, happened to be black, you know, but uh, he was a leading left intellectual. 
Uh, and while you're absolutely right in saying that there's plenty of racism in the left, it seems to me that's the place where there's been least of it. And in fact, it's kind of interesting if you look at labor history. So take, say, the Homestead Strike, which I mentioned before. Uh, I don't think there were very many blacks there, but there was plenty of the equivalent of racism. I mean, at that time, it was against the Huns. Anybody from Eastern Europe was called a Hun. You know, it's like from Slovakia or Hungary or anything like that. And they were treated just like blacks. And there was vicious ethnic hatreds in Homestead in that region. They were overcome during the strike. That was the first time that people actually cooperated across ethnic grounds. Because they were fighting together for something. That happened in the formation of the CIO. Uh, then it was a lot of black workers. Uh, black and white workers were actually working together on the CIO. Uh, and it seems to me there are plenty of common, and that happened in the civil rights movement. You know, there are plenty of common struggles which bring people together. Like SNCC, for example, was very open. You know, it was white, black, anything. Uh, and uh, uh, SNCC got destroyed, and I think that's part of the reason for it. So your, your point is right. The society is very racist. Uh, it's got other kinds of divisions, and you've got to keep conscious of them, and you have to overcome them. About the praxis point, I'm not so sure I agree. I mean, you know, when you say there's no praxis, I don't exactly know what that means. I mean, there are plenty of things that can be done. I don't think they have to be described with fancy terms. And we do the things that can be done, you know, the kinds of things that are uh, the next stage where we are now. And I don't think that there's any general formulas about that. Uh, you just ask where you are, you know, what are the problems that exist, uh, where are people ready to move, and you try to do something with them. Uh, there's a spectrum of them, and there's no simple answer as to which ones are, should have the priorities. People judge differently. But I'm very skeptical if somebody comes down with a praxis, you know, like some formula saying, here's the way we're supposed to do it. I'd be really skeptical about that. We have, we have time for yeah. one more question, a brief question, because we have about five minutes, or else the dean will be. First of, all, first of all, I want to say just very quickly that last night I saw this Time magazine on the, with the front cover um, regarding that IQ um, book that you had mentioned, and I was just appalled by it. No, because I thought if I was yeah. a black man in this country, I would not know what to do with myself. How about if you were a black woman? OJ Simpson. How about a black and woman? Did you notice? Did you read the article? Or a black I mean, the woman. article claims that one of the things it discusses is the idea that black women don't nurture their children. You know, and that's because they came from Africa, where the climate was such and such. You know, I mean, you know, this is stuff that's right out of the Nazis. You know. It's just, I, I was thinking, how would I feel? And you know what? I just. I don't know what to do. I mean, it's just rage. Maybe I would wake up every day. Maybe I'd be despondent. Maybe i try to relate to other people as human beings. But inside, there would be a burning fire. See, but I think the right, I, I mean, I agree with that emotional reaction. But if you think about it, the right way to respond is to ask, what are they doing it for? And they're doing it for a very simple reason. Uh, like I said last night, 40% of the kids in New York, most of them are black and Hispanic, are living below the poverty line. That means they're destroyed. Okay. Well, you can't, and that's the result of very definite social policies, which are supported by the New York Times. Okay. Uh, there are certain social policies which are driving people down to destruction. Well, you can't say that plainly. So you need some cover. Well, what's the cover? Okay. Bad genes. You know. Who knows? Maybe. You know. But and, and once you understand that, then you know how to deal with it. You know. Well, you know, it's not. It's not that their audience wants to hear that. Uh, it's that, I mean, some of it does. It's that that's the proper ideology. Just as, as it was proper for the Nazis at some point to say Jews are a virus that's destroying our society, uh, it is proper for the New York Times to run articles taking seriously the idea that black mothers don't nurture their children. And like, take me, Ashkenazic Jews, we're supposed to be at the top. We have small families, because that's what we're like. That's why my mother came from a family with 11 kids, you know, because Ashkenazic Jews have small families. Of course, she was an East European, you know, living in a peasant society. Maybe that had something to do with it. No, 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 that's not what social science tells you. Uh, okay, well, that's, you know, these, these things are such, are such transparent ideological weapons that you don't even, you shouldn't even bother arguing about them. We should just understand them transparently for what they are. I'm in a real commissar culture. 
uh, which uh, is dedicated to trying to obscure the most elementary truths uh, and therefore uh, is able to do things like this on the front cover of the New York Times. Well, that's the world we're living in. And, you know, you can understand the emotional reaction and it's easily understandable, but it's not the right one. Because what's going on is very transparent. This doesn't have anything to do with evil and God. This has to do with rich, powerful people trying to justify the fact that they are pursuing social policies which are forcing children to die. That's what it has to do with. It doesn't, not in my opinion. I mean, if he does for you, okay, but for me, he doesn't. For me, no, it has nothing to do with God. I don't think he has anything to do with it. 